I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to say first about the meditation that <clears throat> in psycho-spiritual practice, and I've been exposed to many, many kinds of practices and different frames and traditions, and there are certainly some that I do not know much about, but I would say in my explorations, I've seen a lot of words thrown around, and it's easy to get confused by them. Consciousness, you know, space, reality, and it's so important as the Buddha taught and practiced, to keep coming down to earth, back to your direct experience. And I find, as I think many people do, hopefully you among them, that when you just let your mind calm and settle out, you, 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 reduce chasing after little preoccupations or you know trains of thought that carry you away and and you you help yourself be okay just in the present not chasing anything not running from anything you're just okay you can support that experience with a sense of openness, wideness, and spaciousness, which has some neurological underpinnings. You can also support this by finding a kind of heartfeltness, which also has neurological underpinnings in the ways that it helps you uh, be all right in the present as it is. You can be aware as well of the reassuring sense of going on being, Whatever the future may hold, in the present, there's a here-ness. And as that happens, you start resting more in a sense of simply being. That's the experience. It's not the be-all and end-all necessarily of full awakening, but it's certainly foundational. And in that sense of being, you start to recognize that there's a quality of awareness and warm-heartedness, lovingness, kindness that is inherent and feels deeper than personality, deeper than the conventional eye. It's, it's the basis, it's the foundation of being in which the sense of I occurs. And then identity gradually starts to shift more and more into that underlying ground of being, which can start to feel even uh, as the bottom really falls out, uh, extensive into or extending into reality broadly. But just simply at the personal level, uh, that quality of beingness is, is a fantastic foundation and refuge. In it is basically no suffering. In simply being, there is no suffering. Uh, suffering may pass through it, but in being itself is, is not suffering. Really quite profound, and a real encouragement to explore that in simple terms for you, experientially, coming into the present, letting go of the past and the future, relaxing the sense of self, openness, stability of presence, open-heartedness, gradually landing, arriving in the foundations of who we each are. Yes, as Brenda points out, hello, my friend Brenda. Um, clear when I say it, you know, hard to feel it, but that's what practice is about. But in an ongoing practice, you rest here more and more, and it helps to have an ongoing practice. So I wanted to build on this and talk about something really quite frankly that has um, come, come to me personally that I think has maybe implications for you as well. 
And uh, bear with me here as I talk about two kinds of escape. Now, what do I mean by that? So in the first case, you know, just about myself, uh, grew up in a loving and decent um, home, caring parents on the adverse childhood events scales. I actually have zero, zero. And also in this now emerging, and you could look it up, positive childhood experiences scale, I also had a very low score. So there wasn't a lot of overt disturbance. There was no poverty, no divorce, no mental illness in my parents, no alcoholism, no physical abuse, no craziness in the home. But for a lot of different reasons, there was there was not much, I didn't experience much that was positive. Some of that was my own doing, um, not to blame kids, but just kids have agency too of a sort. A lot of it was just kind of the culture of my parents grew up in and intergenerationally they pass it along. And as a result, there was a, a kind of a lot of unhappiness in me and feelings of a lot of inadequacy like there was something really squirrely or wrong in myself. And that set me on a kind of journey that many people have to escape from who we fear we are. Think about this, how it might apply to you, a ways in which you're, you're trying to escape from um, a sense of inadequacy or a presumption that something is missing deep inside you, escape from the fear that you're unlovable or you know, dismissible, not worth very much, and escape from that by trying to get away from it, trying to maybe get to some kind of better place. Escape from the sense that kids develop and adults carry, uh, if you've had insecure attachment growing up, escape from the sense that um, there's something about you that uh, is not good or not right in relationships. This is a very deep and psychological source of suffering. It's not really talked about in the Pali Canon, the, you know, the, the key surviving written text of um, early Buddhism. But psychologically, it's a real issue for many, many people. The sense of wanting to escape from or get away from or get out of certain things, especially certain sense of identity, who you are. What's really remarkable is to appreciate that the process of trying to escape from who we fear we are, deep down, in some ways perpetuates what we fear we are because we're kind of caught in that script. The effort to escape it presumes it. And the presuming of it maintains it. You can't escape from what you continuously presume. Darn, <laughs> I thought I was smart. No, not about this. And so then the question becomes, what do we, what's actually already true such that the, the presumed qualities in ourselves, we don't need to escape from. And so I wanna ask you to consider maybe four words that might apply to you as a little kid or are deep in your nature today that intuitively come to you as a description of yourself. Four words, you could use six if you like, or just two or three. Qualities about you, that you would look at yourself as a, as a little kid, and you would look at yourself as a young person in general, and then deep down inside, all right? What are basic qualities you have? For example, 
you know, you might have a basic quality of, of curiosity, maybe, maybe mingling with gratitude. You might have a basic quality of resourcefulness. Like you try, you try to figure stuff out, you try to solve problems, make things better, resourcefulness. You might have a, a basic quality of, of a kind of maybe cheerfulness, you know, not overly positive, but just a kind of recognizing the good, looking for the good. Maybe you have a basic quality of, of creativity, generativity. What's true about you deep down that is, is inherently true about you? Maybe you have a basic quality of, um, of a kind of lovingness, a kindness, a sweetness about you deep down. Perhaps there are other words you might use about yourself. I think those qualities and with generativity or creativity I've named five really characterize a lot of people. And it could be so profoundly reassuring and the undoing of the search when you recognize these qualities in yourself. This is not some new age Hallmark card mumbo jumbo. This is hardcore clear seeing that frees. Rob Berbea, spelled B-U-R-B-E-A, extraordinary teacher, bless his memory, died of cancer some years ago, uh, wrote a book called Seeing That Frees. It's one of my favorite books about practice. It's very deep. What is that seeing which frees? Rob is going after, he's not a therapist, I think. He's going after the kind of seeing, seeing into the nature of experiences that free, including seeing into the nature of the presumptions that we want to escape from. I'm speaking here at a more conventional level of the seeing of your own actual qualities that can free you from the presumption, what Tara Brock calls the trance of unworthiness. That is the engine of so much of our seeking and searching, which unfortunately, as I've said, maintains the structure of a lot of our suffering. In other words, can you find a sense um, inside yourself of having already arrived <laughs> as the person that you've been searching for, that you've been seeking in your escape from who you fear you are. Sainthood is not necessary. Perfection is not necessary. But can there be a kind of releasing of the search for an escape from what you presume about yourself and an arriving in what's actually beautifully true? This is a very important kind of practice. In my own experience in the kind of the Buddhist world in the West, uh, uh, you find some aspects of this, but not that much, really. I haven't seen much of it in my own kind of Theravadan Vipassana-centered background, uh, nor in my familiarity with Zen, which is growing. Others know a lot more about it. Perhaps in different schools of Tibetan practice, there could be this recognition of the value of recognizing what is the good news that is already true in your fundamental qualities as a person, but not a lot of it. So I think there's some real value here in recognizing the good qualities in yourself that are already true, that you don't need to search for because they're already found. 
it's almost a taboo to give up the search because maybe there's a fear like in business, I've had a lot of business experience, where that you're going to lose your edge. You know, I think about the Dos Equis ad with the most interesting man in the world, supposedly, you know, uh, who closes the ad by saying, stay thirsty, my friends. Yeah, there are a lot of levels to that. But one of the levels is that the root of the word for craving in Pali, the language of, a key language of early Buddhism, tanha, tanha, the root of the word tanha is thirst. Something's missing. Stay thirsty. Why stay thirsty? Why not feel already quenched? <laughs> In fact, just to play on the words, nirvana, nibbana, means uh, the, essentially the fire is quenched. The flame has gone out because it no longer has fuel. You know, if we stay quenched rather than thirsty, the underlying basis for the craving that creates suffering and harm is released. We're quenched. That's actually a kind of translation in English for a conventional common use of the word nibbana, or rather uh, nibbana. Nibbana has you know, a fire that's gone out. It's quenched. Right? So anyway, in, in psychological terms, kind of down to earth, what, do it, what does it feel like? And there are different words that are, that are being offered here in the chat. You might see them. You know, how might it feel like a very intimate and emotional releasing of a kind of seeking and searching, escaping that drives a lot of suffering to land in a kind of claiming of yourself as, let's say, fundamentally, at bottom, curious and grateful and glad about what you find. Or perhaps, what? how might it help you to realize that, wow, at bottom you really are a resourceful person who makes efforts, who tries. Letting that one land. Independent of what other people do or how they treat you or what they're like, whatever. What might, be, what might it be like third to just kind of land in, wow, your version of saying this. I'm a basically loving person. I like wish to love. I'd rather love than hate. I'd rather be caring rather than callous or cruel. What might it be like as a releasing from, en from an engine of contraction and drivenness that leads to suffering to feel that you are, um, that there's a, a kind of like sweetness you know, in the core of your disposition. Maybe there's other stuff too, and still a fundamental core of sweetness. What might it be like to, to claim as true, if you can find it as true, and I think you probably can, that in you all along somewhere has been a knowing of a kind of ultimate peacefulness because some part of you partakes of that fundamental untroubledness, undisturbedness, fundamental disconnectedness from disturbance, fundamental peacefulness. Oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> and it's kind of wild, isn't it? I'm feeling chagrined here that it's, it's so accessible to kind of connect with, okay, what's actually really true about you? Sometimes covered over, sometimes obscured or, you know, 
swept away, but really at bottom, your home base of what's true about you. It's remarkable, isn't it? The, 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 the emotional intimacy and effectiveness of connecting with this, given how powerful it is and how true it is, it's wild. <laughs> we don't connect that much with it. Me included, Mr. Psychologist here. Um, wild. And in this, the feeling, which you may be perhaps having some bits of, if not a lot of, the sense of relief, the sense of reassurance, a kind of like laying something down, whoosh, that's a guide that you're on the right track. Even a kind of wild abandon, like, oh, I just don't need to carry all that around. I, I can let go of that script. I, I don't need to like keep living in the framework as a kind of context of that effort to escape what I presume to be true as, as I rest in the arriving of what's actually true. And that's really good and good and good and good. So that's one kind of escape. And then I want to talk about a different kind of escape that's more centered in traditional teachings in early Buddhism. And I think these two kinds of escape that are sort of the opposite of each other will land in, a, in the same place. So I've been talking so far about what I would call a, in a sense, unhealthy attempt at escape and a kind of attempt at escape that is grounded in ignorance and not seeing the truth of who you actually are truth of who I actually am. Then there's another kind of escape that would be that's skillful. And it's summarized in this recurring teaching in the Buddha Dharma, early Buddhism, of the Buddha describing in his own practice and recommending to others that they recognize three things. They recognize the gratification in some pleasure or goal or aim, some seeking some pursuit. They recognize the payoffs, the pleasures even. And they recognize the danger, such as the ways that that drivenness actually deep down is an, is an engine of suffering. It, the contractions in it, the drivenness in it, the reinforcing of the engine of craving in our neurobiology of it is dangerous for full emancipation, full freedom. And the highest happiness. And if and the danger in just simply having healthy, good relations with people in everyday life, the danger and the escape, that word is present in that passage in the Pali Canon recurring. The gratification, the danger, and the escape. So there you are. There I am, right? And something happens with someone in my life, okay? And what comes forward is, let's say, a very gratifying sense of being right about something, and they're wrong. I see it better. I see it more clearly. Can you believe it? They did it again. Right? Kind of an exasperated righteousness with a certain oomph behind it. Anger has reward molecules releasing in your brain feels good in a weird way. Maybe that's it. Or maybe, you know, you walk by that aisle in the supermarket and, you know, <laughs> those, uh, I don't know what, hostess Twinkies are calling to you. Or you walk down the, uh, you know, the, the wine and beer aisle and, oh, that's a different kind of calling. That tends to call to me more than the sweets do. I had an alcoholic grandfather. I have to be very careful about those particular gratifications. And so... Uh, you know, you, you recognize the gratifications, the gratifications of righteousness, the gratifications of various pleasures, maybe the gratifications of, you know, a kind of drivenness around getting stuff done or insisting on a kind of orderliness in your own home, whatever. Then you can also recognize the danger, the fact that you're choosing a lesser happiness over a greater happiness. Or that, yeah, there might be a, you know, a pleasure for half an hour or a couple hours or so, but then you wake up hungover the next morning 
or over the long haul, you're not being a good friend to your own physical body in terms of long-term health. You different, or you recognize that, yeah, you might score points. You know, you you were right, but you're losing the war. You win battles but lose the war. Forgive the metaphor. Um, in terms of your long-term harmony in relationships, all right? The danger. The Buddha was all over this. <laughs> You know, this kind of preci precision and honesty and experience closeness is very well elaborated in early Buddhism. You see less and less of it as the Mahayana traditions proceed, which had themselves many strengths, of course. But I want to really highlight the value down and dirty, this recognition, gratification and danger. And a lot of real-time mindfulness and granular real-time mindfulness in the present is about recognizing the gratification, the payoffs, and the costs right? of a lot of our reactive patterns with other people, with ourselves, with our body, with how we move through our day, the gratification and the danger. And then he teaches the escape in a fundamental and healthy way. The disidentification from that pattern, that habit of gratification and danger, the stepping back from it, spaciousness, it arises. We've escaped from it when we're mindful of it. It may still be running through your mind, you know, like a, like a teleprompter or a chiron in a Newscast, newscast running across the surface of the movie of awareness, the screen of awareness, but there you are witnessing it. You've escaped. Yeah, it's still happening. It's not completely um, escaped from it, but you're not identified with it anymore. That's an important kind of escape. Being honest with yourself about short-term gain, long-term pain. That's a kind of escape. Having what's called in Pali, nibbida, which really means disenchantment, a kind of waking up from the inner advertising agency that over promises rewards from various things and over promises threats. Like, oh my gosh, I got to get away from that. It's, it's an inner ad agency trying to manipulate and motivate us in all kinds of ways. Just recognizing that with a certain disenchantment, with repetition. Uh huh. There you go again, trying to sell me on a bill of goods. There you go again, telling me it's threat level orange when, you know, it's really threat level chartreuse at the most, you know, green with a drop of yellow. That's an escape. And ultimately, identifying increasingly as we did in meditation with being, ongoing being is a kind of fundamental escape from the contents of consciousness because you're resting in the being, in a not the being, you're resting in beingness, in ongoing being as the ground of the contents of consciousness, right there. And ultimately through uh, very direct experiences, uh, if experience is even a fair word, of that which is unconditioned, distinct from conditioned phenomena, we've escaped from the conditioned wheel in a, in a very ultimate kind of sense. That's difficult to talk about, but um, very real to have a growing sense of. So we have these two kinds of escape, don't we? We have the problematic kind of escape that I really talked about at some length in the very beginning, and then we have a wise kind of escape. When we escape from the problematic escape, we land in the results, the fruits of the wise escape, which is a sense of, uh, of our all rightness already, rested in various sweet qualities that have a lot of emotional richness and texture and life. Sweet qualities like recognizing that willingness and wishfulness in you to find the good in reality. What is good? The 
kindness, good-heartedness, lovingness in you for others. Recognizing that, whew, craving starts to fall away. Recognizing more and more that underlying ground of ongoing being. Ah, with inherent awareness and um, warm-heartedness in it. Oh, you've arrived, in other words, in both kinds of ways, in a really, really good place that undermines so much of our suffering and our difficulties with other people, and if I may say, feels really, really good. As I finish my kind of talk here, it's interesting that you can probably experience it with me, that we wish for others, don't we? We wish for others to escape from the problematic you know, desire to escape that is based on presumptions that are false about who you really are. We wish for them to be okay with themselves as they are, to, to land in, in a knowing of the good qualities in them that we see, to feel like they can kind of lower their guard. You know, they don't need to impress other people so much. You know, it's okay to be you. You be you. It's okay to be who you really are. We'd wish that for that for them. I wish that for you. And much as you wish it for others, perhaps you wish it for me, you can know that it's possible to wish it for yourself. Okay. So, questions or comments? Lots of questions and comments have come in through the chat. Uh, you can always know that I will have read the fullness of the chat, um, even though I won't be able to respond to many. We'll just see um, what I see here. And, and I hope this has spoken to you. If you were to really bottom line it all, one practice for you could be, what are your four words <laughs> or phrases? And they don't have to be four, it could be three or six, but of who you really are. You know, the qualities in you as a little kid, that's one way to see it. You know, a three-year-old, a six-year-old, underneath it all when you were 13. And then in you today, what are your four words or four qualities such that you can land in them and let go of the search? So, um, so Holly asked a question that's really key. At 53 minutes past the hour, take a peek. Uh, would, Rick, would you please speak a bit to the differences between working with acceptance and surrender versus falling into resignation? I am practicing with opening up to what is in difficult circumstances without feeling defeated or disempowered. Great question. So, <clears throat> Uh, there's a term in Thera Theravadan psychology called the near enemy, and it, it has to do with qualities, ways of being that are close to what we really are aiming for, but actually not the same. So a near enemy of acceptance is resignation. And um, re resignation, particularly with the affective sense of that's depressed, kind of, ugh depressed. That's really different from a kind of bareness of acceptance. Now in the acceptance, definitely sometimes can be a kind of mourning or a grieving, a natural human releasing of, of hopes that will not be fulfilled. You really let it land like, whoa, you know, I'm never, uh, I'm going to be living with cancer for the rest of my life, perhaps, if that's true. Or uh, I've lost a loved one, and that loved one is not coming back. Uh, I'm still dealing with a fair amount of grief over the loss of a beloved cat nearly two years ago. Um, but in the acceptance, it, it's not overwhelming. 
Resignation has this kind of sense of defeat attached to it. It's not about that. It's just simply being in reality as it is. So there's a distinction there. And what I find is that to be able to really rest in an accepting of how it is, we really need to be in touch with that which is nourishing. Because otherwise it just feels like I'm going to use a, an expression, we're just kind of bare ass naked, you know, exposed to the cold winds. It's really important to um, be in touch with, with those core qualities in yourself or that underlying sense of beingness so that we can tolerate uh, the rawness of, ex, of acceptance. I'm just scanning through the questions. So I'm going to see if uh, I'm going to speak with Gloria and Wendy. I think we have time for that for sure. So Gloria, I'm asking you to unmute. I'm going to at the beginning you talk about a book in uh, early Buddhism that we were talking about that before about the uh, the the uh, oh, it was too much. Well, the 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 gratitude and the other one was the. Um, Forgot now. <laughs> okay. The, yeah, the other one that I ask, uh, the escape, the escape. That's it. So, could you kindly give us the name of that? Because I think it's such a good. It's it's, it's a lot of 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 material today. Good. So yeah. maybe it would be easier to have more reading while uh, while ah, putting in practice of that. <laughs> okay. So I'll I'll ask it this way. That's great, Gloria. I love it. And me. You know, I love the fortune cookie approach to teaching the Dharma. You know what I mean? Like, get to it. Good stuff. Okay. First, so I talked about two things tonight. Number one, who are you, deep down, who are you afraid you are that you're trying not to be? This is a huge aspect of the psychology of most people. Who are you afraid you are? that you're trying not to be. That's what I'm talking about when I say escape from who you're afraid you are. Just that. And related to that, what happens when you actually realize key qualities of your innate nature? What happens right there? For a lot of people, fireworks go off, tears flow, there's a real sense of release. So that's the first thing, okay? So for you, Gloria, if it's relevant, and for some people it's not, but if it is relevant, deep down, who are you trying not to be or who do you fear you might be? If you lower your guard or stop pressuring yourself or stop you know, seeking to be somebody right? And instead, what happens when you really rest in um, a feeling of having, and you find a way to feel like you've already arrived? You're already okay. You're already good. In, in these qualities that are already natural to you. Ah, okay. So we have to really go back to the qualities. Inside yourself. And, and it's looking directly. It's not a big philosophy. It's looking directly, uh, one. And then the other part of tonight is about this classic, you can find it, you can just search on Google or go into a place called Access to Insight. Access to Insight.org, I think. Somebody could put that in the chat. Access to Insight is a wonderful source of um, online and free of uh, the Pali Canon, the or, yeah, uh, translations essentially from the Pali of the early teachings of the Buddha. You can also find translate or, or those teachings in Chinese and Sanskrit in some places, but Pali, P-A-L-I is the main place. So anyway, if you go to Access to Insight and you just put in three words, right? Gratification, danger, escape, it'll pull up a number of those passages. Really useful. Okay. All right, thanks, Gloria. Awesome. All right, you take care. Great. Okay, Wendy, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Great. Asking you to unmute. Great. Hi, Rick. I just have a succinct 
quick appreciation that I've been holding in my heart ever since I started studying with you. Is that okay? Just a little teeny tiny? Oh, lay it on me. It'll be good. It'll be good for me. Hopefully it'll be good for you and others. I don't know, but okay. When we're talking about childhood, it just really it resonated with me because it's the late mm -hmm. 70s, 80s. We raised ourselves. I was melancholy. Mm -hmm. I thought there was something wrong with me. And I remember sitting down to Mr. Rogers and just feeling like, okay, I'm okay. And I feel like you are an adult version for this of Mr. Rogers. And I just so appreciate every time I finish with you, I feel like I'm okay and I'm going to be okay. So just oh, it's so touching. I revere him. I think he was an American saint. And um, I'm so touched by that. You probably have seen a beautiful documentary about him. The Tom Hanks movie, some people like. For me, it was a little jarring because I have such a strong sense of, of Frank, you know, Mr. Rogers, but that documentary about him, if you haven't seen it, it's really great. And also his Emmy Award he got, you may have seen that, I don't know, uh, where he basically invites everybody to take 10 seconds to reflect on who loved them into being, anyway. But thank you, Wendy, that's really great. Well, if I could lay something on you here from my own background in the 70s, uh, I've never done this in this group, so this will be fresh, Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike, LA teacher, you look it up. He had a practice he had people do in, in workshops where they would come to his large churches, you know, and, and um, sermons. And they, people would walk around the room and they would say to, they would just walk up to a total stranger, take a moment to sort of tune into them. And then they would say something, the presence of something in me recognizes the presence of that in you. And then there'd be a moment of letting it land, then they'd switch roles. You might think about that form in your friendships, in your work environments as appropriate, certainly in an intimate relationship. You know, the presence of something in me recognizes the presence of that in you, right? And so I would just have to say, Wendy, the presence of Mr. Rogers in me recognizes the presence of Mrs. Rogers, <laughs> Mr. Rogers in you. you. Good stuff, thank you. So let's bring it down to earth as we finish here. Let's just practice for a minute together. Um, take a moment and pick one quality that's genuine in yourself. You may be covered over, you may not be in touch with it all the time. Pick one thing, perhaps gratefulness or delight, playfulness, tender love. I'll be quiet for about half a minute and just see if you can Take that quality in effect as your object of meditation. And, and stay in touch with it for half a minute. Letting yourself land in this quality. Letting the truth of it spread throughout you. Letting yourself identify with this, in a sense. In your own way of saying it to yourself, something like, this is me.
I don't know what you are experiencing, but I can tell you, it is you. Thank you.